Dear participants, welcome to the third webinar conducted as part of the webinar series organized by the PG Department of English in association with IQAC of NSS College, Andhra. To start the proceedings officially, let me welcome Dr. J. Anjana, head of the Department of English, NSS College, Andhra. Welcome you, ma'am. Thank you, Good morning, all. Welcome back to the third session of the webinar series hosted by the Department of English, NSS College, Pandalam, in association with the IQAC of the college. Today, we're going to have yet another exciting session on a very interesting topic, the controversial trip Tagore and China by a brilliant academician and an authority on Tagore, Dr. Amit Sen. Dr. Sen is presently professor and head Department of English, Bishop Haridi Shantiniketan. His areas of interest are 18th century studies, travel writing, Tago studies, the history of science, etc. He has published a number of articles and books on Tago. The Centenary Edition, Rabindranath Tagore, The Unsung Hero, Rabindranath Tagore and His Circle, Sharing the Dream, The Remarkable Women of Shantiniketan, Confluence of Minds, Rabindranath Tagore and Patrick Jedis Reader on Education and Environment, The Scottish Enlightenment and the Bengal Renaissance, The Continuum of Ideas, Shantini Gainer for Visitors, The Bengali Chemist, Acharya Prabhula Chandra Ray and Postcoloniality, Vasundhara, Rabindranath Tagore and uh, the Environment, and many more. He has also translated and performed in Tagore's dance dramas at national and international programs. He's presently the joint editor of Bishop Bharati Quarterly. He's the recipient of the Outstanding Thesis Award by the Government of India, the Research Award by the UGC, the Oxford 18th Century Bursary, and a host of academic recognitions. He has traveled extensively as project coordinator for the UQRA Award to Edinburgh, Scotland, as invited speaker to the University of Oxford, um, in Hems University, Cairo, and also deliver the Tagore Memorial Lecture at the Rabindranath Tagore Center under the Mahatma Gandhi Institute at Mauritius. It is a great privilege and honor to have you with us today, sir. On behalf of the department, the college, and the accuracy of the college, I extend a warm welcome to you, sir. I welcome each and every participant across India Kindly bear with us for the as, as we have a of heavy rains in Kerala today. Thank you so much for joining us. Dear Hello. 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 Yes, yes, sir. We can hear you. Should I should I start? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. Yes, sir. Is the screen visible? Sure, sure. Yes, sir. Right. Uh, a very good morning to all of you. I would like to first thank uh, Dr. Rajesh, the principal of NSS College Pandalam, uh, for providing me with this opportunity of sharing my thoughts with you. I'd like to thank Dr. Anjana, the head of the department and such a gracious host. Of course, Sri Prashad my uh, friend through Facebook and through the webinars. Uh, fortunately, the lockdown hasn't meant a lockdown in friendships. So thank you, Sri Prashad, for uh, inviting me. Uh, could I please request all, all participants to please mute your uh, audios? Otherwise, you know, it becomes very distracting for me. Uh, uh, Sri Prashad, one just last question before I start. Are you recording this uh, uh, lecture? Because if you do, I uh, please do so that I can have a copy later. Yes, sir. It's already yes. gone live on Facebook. Uh, sorry, YouTube, sir. Right. And Thank you so much. We are recording the same thing. Yeah. Yes. Sir. Right. In case uh, there's a problem with the audio, please immediately uh, sort of let me know uh, so that I can, you know, come oh, yeah. back to the point where I uh, sort of stopped. Sure, sir. Right. Sure, sir. 
once yes, again yes, a request yes. to participants please do not uh, sort of please mute your audio so that you know it becomes easier for me right. uh, my uh, my discussion is titled the controversial so, trip Uh, Ashri, could you please mute the others? Yes, sir. Yes. Vendit, sir, please. Right. Am I audible now? Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank yes. you so much. Right. Uh, so, uh, this is titled The Controversial Trip Tagore and China. and refers to rabindranath's trip of 1924 and 25 to china now uh, when uh, shri invited me i initially thought about talking about the south african writer james katsia but then i thought that since china has been in the news lately in india and china for all uh, difficult reasons maybe it would be uh, worthwhile to take a look at how uh, rabindranath tagore uh, sort of visualized china and what his experience of the of the china encounter actually was and therefore uh, i am trying to revisit 1924 in order to learn how uh, the reactions that rabindranath faced are in many ways being repeated in 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 many fold ways really uh, today itself so uh, before i start let me let me go back to a few uh, sort of uh, theories about travel writing which i will use here because tagore was one of the most prolific of travelers uh, the question is why does one why does one travel is travel an act of volition the next question i would like to ask is whether travel and why does one write about travel is it a further critical act of volition with its deliberate strategies of sifting and exclusion my point here remains that if one travels if travel is an act then the act of travel writing is a follow up act it is not necessary that everybody writes about their travels and once you start writing about travel you include something you exclude something now we have to see that if the act of travel writing is a conscious act then for the man who wrote about all his travels the act of not writing about travel is also an act of volition so my question is why did not tagore write about his china travels therefore i am exploring that gap that hiatus that opens up between the act of travel and the act of travel writing with the argument that the refusal to write is also therefore an act of volition a complex response and a protest now rabindranath of course was india's first global traveler with his footprints in every continent except australia and africa now uh, for the record rabindranath was an extremely seasick person stayed at shantiniketan which was quite at that point of time difficult to reach from kolkata although the railways had started so you need to see this act of rabindranath traveling to almost all the contours of the earth as almost a heroic act one of the most rabindranath was also one of the most prolific writers of travel with nine volumes of travel writing in bangla mostly travel uh, published as letters but there are certain glaring omissions in tagore's travel writings he did not write about some of his trips and these included his five trips to america to italy and of course the one which we are going to talk about china the question is why did rabindranath refuse to write about these travels and i will attempt to place his tra travels within a broader framework of the theory of travel and travel writing because i am are going to argue that rabindranath was devising a new theory of 
travel, almost indigenous theory of travel peculiar to his own philosophy. What was this theory? Rabindranath, very interestingly, talks about all foreign travel as Tirtha. Now, Tirtha is a, is a word which is, I'm sure, familiar to my audience across India, uh, or a pilgrimage. And he suggests, and this is uh, in, his, uh, in his work of work called Jatra Purbapatro, he says, it is not merely pleasure that I crave, it's also motivated by a sense of profit. And he says that if any European travels to India with a genuine respect, so it's the way in which you travel, it's the motivation with which you travel, he attains the goals of a pilgrimage. Right. Now, therefore, all travel to Europe also, and all travel across the world for Rabindranath was a pilgrimage. Now, what are the ideas, operative ideas of the pilgrimage? This is something that I'd like to take up for a brief while. Now, every pilgrimage is a conscious act once again. You do not go as a tourist to pilgrimages. There is always a samkalpa or a motive, a, a certain kind of mannat that you make. And you have to make an effort, a klesha, to reach the site of pilgrimage. That is, that is why you'll see that the pilgrim will have to walk the extra mile, will have to travel the stairs, will, and we are talking about the early half of the 20th century, where, you know, klesha in attaining the pilgrimage is the effort made by the pilgrim. Then, of course, comes the concept of saucha, the cleansing. You will find that most pilgrimages are associated with water spots water bodies. And therefore, this act of cleansing is not merely a physical act of cleansing, it is also an act of spiritual cleansing before the deity. And finally, you bring back the prasadam, the tirtha fal, the prasadam, which is not only for you and your family, but also to be spread amidst the community. Now, Tagore, who used words with such precision, was aware of the Sanskrit tirtha and its structure and applied it in his own idea of travel. Key to uh, Tagore's idea, of course, is the idea of the philosophy of Rabindranath, is the idea of Vishwabodh. Now, the two English words which are equivalent to this are universalism and cosmopolitanism. But for Tagore, this concept of Vishwabodh is actually derived from the Upanishadic idea of the Brahman, which is one. And Tagore says that we have to unite our feeling with this all pervasive infinite feeling. And all our poetry, philosophy, science, art, and religion serve to extend the scope of our consciousness. So the fusion of the personal consciousness with the world consciousness is what Rabindranath is looking at in Vishwabodh. So we are part of this entire world. And for Tagore, when Tagore talks about the world, it is not only about the world of man, but also about the world of nature. And he suggests that the liberation of consciousness from the mystifications and exaggerations of the self is key to Vishwabodh that when he meets the eternal in all man, then he is emancipated, for then he discovers the fullest significance of the world into which he is born. Then he finds himself in perfect truth and his harmony with the all is established. This is a very fundamental text that Rabindranath is writing called Sadhana. Remember this, he's writing in America in 1913, immediately after you know, Gitanjali has been published and before he has won the Nobel Prize. So it's very interesting to see how the theory of travel is amalgamated with this theory of the world consciousness or Vishwabodh. Now travel is crucial to this idea of Vishwabodh. Why? Because travel initiates familiarity with other cultures. Travel involves 
the exchange of ideas, art forms, and human resources. Travel radiates to the community, to the university, and the broader community at large. Rabindranath's Vishwa Bharati, his motto was Yatra Vishwam Bhavat Teka Neelam, where the whole world makes its home in a single nest. So this inclusivity that travel fosters. And Rabindranath suggests that travel has, and he's advocating this theory, that travel also has the possibility of equality rather than a structure of power. Because you see, this travel is antithetical to the colonial travel, which is embedded within structures of power. For Rabindranath, the new concept of travel would be where power structures would not be uh, there. Of course, one might argue that Tagore is an utopian in that sense, but aren't all philosophers and poets also in certain ways utopian. Uh, <clears throat> therefore, Rabindranath, in one of the small haikus, and this is where he's writing this when he's traveling to Japan, this travelogue to Japan is called Japan Jatri, suggesting that the saint in saffron once taught your nation. So he's referring to the way in which Buddhism was carried to Japan. And then he's asking for modern education back to India. Today he goes to your door as a disciple to learn a different education. So travel is back and forth, always exchange of ideas and knowledge for Rabindranath. Now, the question is, therefore, Rabindranath has this four-part structure in mind. You travel with a sankalpa. You make uh, one mandate that you're traveling because of this. Then you undergo a klesha, where you try to understand the country where you are traveling to, its culture. You familiarize itself, yourself with it. Then comes the saucha, so that there's a broadening of yourself by the country you're traveling to. And finally, the Tirtha Fal, where you actually bring back something from the country you've traveled to and radiate it amongst your own country. See how Tagore is accepting the Sanskrit root of Tirtha and trying to sort of embed it into a very modern act of traveling. Now the question is, did Tagore write only and only when these ideas were fulfilled? And did each travel open up a space traveled to as an ideational space where the historical realities were often different from the projection? So Rabindranath is looking at this site in a certain way, but it has changed considerably or it does not accommodate his ideas. And this is something which happened with Japan. And I'm going to see this happening with China as well. Uh, now, Rabindranath is, of course, distinguishing himself from people like Shuniti Chatterjee, who are empirical travel writers who record everything in their travelogues. So not a single detail is lost. And Rabindranath places travel writing as literature rather than history, ideational rather than empirical. And therefore, the relevance of reading, he says, is in literature. And Therefore, his suggestion is that his travelogues carve a separate niche in trying to look at a particular aspect of the country traveled to. Now, Tagore's positionality while he was traveling was, of course, complex. He was a compulsive traveler. He wrote with the purpose, he traveled with the purpose of generating funds for Bishwabharati often. Tagore was also traveling as India's, Asia's first Nobel laureate poet. So he was traveling to countries where people had only scantily known of his poetry, but knew about the Nobel Prize. He was traveling, of course, as a representative of the East and was therefore embedded and trapped with it as expectation of spirituality. This happened extensively when he traveled to Europe so that Rabindranath's other areas or other areas of work, education, social and rural reconstruction was of course often uh, sort of overlooked. And he was traveling as a sentinel against the submission to the cult of materialism and nationalism. By 1916, 
the nationalism essays had been published and Rabindranath was, along with Roma Rola, one of the most strident voices against the cult of materialism and nationalism. So Tagore's anti, uh, anti uh, Tagore's rather position against nationalism was well established. My question is, did these expectations and roles often come into conflict with each other? Now, the context, let me look at why Rabindranath was so interested in China. Now, I'm sorry, I probably have missed a slide. Yes. Uh, why did Tagore have such a fascination with China? Now, Tagore's grandfather, Varaknath Tagore, had imported Chinese silk as part of the car Tagore and company. So you'll remember that, you know, from the late or the mid uh, 20th century, I'm sorry, 19th century onwards, the Tagores had a strong interest in China. And of course, there's another part to this, that Dwarkanath was also implicated in opium trading and running, you know, this uh, ships to China. So uh, in a certain way, uh, the Tagores were, had business interests in China during his grandfather's time. His father, Devendranath, actually visited China. And Tagore wrote against the opium trade in China. And therefore, the treatise that he wrote was called Chine Moroner Babsha, or the death trade in, uh, in China, and strongly protested against Western imperialism and saw China and India civilizations struggling under colonialism and struggling to come to terms with modernity and nationalism. You see, for Tagore, this, there was this also this concept of a unified Asia with a distinctly oriental spiritual background, which was in many ways trying to come to terms with the Western spirits of nationalism, modernity, and so on and so forth. Now for Tagore, none of these forces were, you know, inimical. He wanted to accept, but accept, but choose and accept rather than accept wholesale, because he saw within Western nationalism, greed and imperialism. Therefore, he wanted an Asia which would posit itself as an alternative to Europe in many ways. And therefore, China became, China and Japan both became very crucial components of this philosophical, political idea as it were. Now, Tagore was of course uh, uh, also uh, popular in China by the time he was traveling in 1924. In fact, uh, <clears throat> Chan Tu Xiu, the founder of the Communist Party, had first translated Gitanjali in 1915. So nine years before Tagore was actually traveling, he was well known there. Interestingly, the poem where the mind is without fear, which most of us have read in our school days, which was also a devotional poem in certain ways, was translated as a poem of protest and revolution. So we already see that the Communist Party of China is trying to read Tagore within a context of revolution and protest, right? And, but, but Chan realized that Tagore was, and he wrote that Tagore is a modern poet of India. He advocated carrying forward the Eastern spiritual culture. Now for the communists, right at this point of time, it was very difficult to uh, sort of accept Tagore, and I'll come to this point in a little while. Now, three stories by Tagore were translated in 1917, and by 1921, the major poems were all translated, four plays, one novel, and two volumes of prose were available. Now, we also will have to look at the context in which Tagore was traveling to China. And this context was the revolution of 4th May, primarily led by the students. Now, this was, of course, tripped or uh, instigated by uh, the Versailles Treaty, where China was, was land of China was ceded to Japan. And the young students in China, therefore, started a huge protest against Western imperialism. They sought the modernization of China. They sought the movement away from the older spiritual 
values which they saw had led China away from activity and into laziness. They also, and very importantly, wanted a revolution in literature. What was this revolution? The revolution was called Pai Hua Fung Tung, which suggested that instead of the Wen Yang, the literary movement, that instead of the high literary movement with its mellifluous language, with its literary language, they would now move towards the Pai Hua Fung Tung or the, the, uh, the language that was used by the masses. If you see, what we are looking at is a sudden emergence of a new trend in China, a trend which the, in which the youth advocated nationalism, modernity, they advocated a literature that belonged to the masses rather than any form of spirituality. In that sense, Marxism was replacing the spirituality of Confucius. And Tagore was squarely caught in between these two differing, almost antithetical binary motions. For the youth, therefore, at this point of time, Tagore was largely a reactionary who was following the older Confucian spiritual model of high literature and spirituality. We need to understand that the aversion to Tagore, as it were, or the hostility to Tagore sort of stemmed from this literary, cultural and political movement. So this is the context before I sort of look at Tagore's itinerary, this needs to be put forth. Now Tagore was, uh, was invited by, uh, by the Peking Lecture Association who brought foreign philosophers to China. And earlier John Dewey and Bertrand Russell had also delivered lectures like Tagore. None of them had faced such hostility. Uh, the chief patrons of Tagore included Liang Shi Shao, Chang Chunmai, Xu Shi Mo, and Chu Chi Ying. Now, all of these were poets who were somewhere associated with the older spiritual high literary movement. And therefore, once Tagore was associated with these people, he automatically lost the sympathy of the youth in China. Right. Uh, and these were people who sort of wanted to go back to traditional Chinese culture. In a sense, then, the invitation was by the traditionalist and was already branding Rabindranath as an anti-modernist whom the leftist intelligentsia would oppose. Right. So this is the context in which he was traveling. Uh, what was Tagore's Sankalpa? Why did he want to go there? Now, you see, after the sort of travel of Fahien and Huan Sang, and the ancient Silk Route had almost disappeared. Right. And of course, Indians traveled to China, but why did they travel? They traveled the soldiers, they traveled to take part in the opium trade. So Indians were looked at derisively by the Chinese. They were opposed to the Indians in that sense of the term because they were seen as stooges of the empire. So Tagore's trip was significant because after a gap of almost a hundred years, you know, an Indian was traveling to China, an Indian who was globally known. So in that sense, Tagore was traveling in the footsteps, as it were, of the great travelers like Fahien and Hu and Sang. Now, when, uh, I'm sorry, uh, when the invitation from China came, Tagore writes, I felt it was an invitation to India and as her humble son, I must accept it. And I am hoping that our visit, he said, will reestablish the cultural and spiritual connections between India and China. So Tagore was not going there in a way as a person. He was going there as a representative of India and he wanted to be a representative of a spiritual India 
talking to a spiritual China. And this is what, you know, uh, created a certain amount of uh, confusion amongst the hosts. Now, we have to also see that Tagore at this point of time was not only a spiritual poet, but he was also a revolutionary in many ways in Bengal. He had spoken against the caste movement. He had initiated rural reform in Bangladesh, Shilai Daho and uh, Shantiniketan. He had written against nationalism extensively and was uh, not very well received in even India. He was undertaking a lot of effort to bring machinery to Shantiniketan. He was trying to institute science learning within India with certain caveats. So in a way, Rabindranath's revolutionary efforts were there, but his overarching identity for the world was that of a spiritual poet. Rabindranath was, as it were, trapped between two identities. And was therefore, my question, is Tagore looking at China as an alternative of coming to terms with modernity and tradition? Because Japan had disappointed him. He had wanted a dhani Japan, a spiritual Japan. Yet when he went there, you know, he found Japan in the throes of a nationalism and industrialization, blindly aping the waste. And Tagore was taken aback by this Japan. So he was looking at an alternative and therefore China became a destination for him. And therefore Tagore knew about his own contradictions and he wrote to Roma Rola in March 24, uh, in March 1924, uh, that he was facing a civil war within himself. As a personality, as a creative artist who is necessarily solitary versus the idealist uh, who had to enter into public discourse. So his question was, do I go there as a poet or as a bearer of good advice and sound common sense? I've already talked about the implications that Rabindranath was opening up a link that had been dormant for a thousand years. And he was welcomed warmly initially at least. However, there was this debate about the message he was bringing and what the implications of his visit would be to a state that had just seen a revolution. Now, the contradictions here, once again, is uh, in 1924, is that there is this cultural conflict between the traditionalist and the leftist intelligentsia, which I have, of course, talked to you about. Uh, the arguments of the leftist intelligentsia was that Oriental civilization was discriminatory. It shamed China and sort of reduced it to a pre-modern state. Of course, please remember that with the opium trade, China was ruthlessly exploited and the Chinese were drugged into taking opium by Western civilization. And therefore, they wrote that we oppose Dr. Tagore so that we may reap the benefits of modern civilization. They added that Tagore's abolition of nationality and politics would promote oppression from foreign powers and that spirituality only led to tolerance of misery and the withdrawal of human endeavor. So this was the point of view of the communists in China at that point of time. Now, here are certain pictures which I brought from the Rabindra Bhavan archives. These are very rare pictures. One or two of them you have seen. But this is then Tagore traveling to China. And with him, you have the poet Kalidash Nag, the artist Nandolal Bose, and of course, the grandfather of Amartya Sen, the great uh, Sanskritist Kiti Mohan Sen. This is Tagore arriving at China. This is another rare picture taken from the Rabindra Bhavan archives. And you can see Tagore with his party landing uh, on the docks of Shanghai. Now this is Tagore's uh, companions in China. Tagore was a great friend and favorite of the poet Xu Shi Mao. And of course, the man who had invited him, Liang Chi Chao, the poet, uh, the traditional poet of China. What was Tagore's initial message? Tagore wrote, do not make use of a poet to carry messages. I am not a philosopher. Unfortunately, this disappeared really later on because he was forced to make public speeches where his messages became more important 
than his identity as a poet. He wrote again and he criticized Western civilization as simply interested in material things and has many defects in its spiritual life. Now Tagore's point was that if Asia blindly aped the imperial uh, concerns and materiality of the West, it would merely become a copy. He wanted Asia to sort of delve into its spiritual uh, traditions, its spiritual resources, and come up with a hybrid response. Unfortunately, the, the people there, the, the, the binaries, thought in terms of either tradition or modernity. Whether a blend was possible through Tagore, they never tried to anticipate. And he talked about Asia waiting for such dreamers to come and carry on the work not of fighting, not of profit making, but of establishing bonds of spiritual bonds of spiritual relationship. <clears throat> now, this is again Tagore's visit to the Temple of Confucius. Now, once again, for the communists, this was seen as Tagore pandering to spirituality, and therefore there was a growing murmur of dissent. Uh, this is again Tagore at the house of Shushi Mo. Uh, this is a house that I visited once I traveled to China in. 2012, but Tagore, of course, went to the forbidden city of, in Peking uh, with his Indian friends here. You can see him. Tagore took a great passion to tree drinking, tea drinking. And of course, when he came back to India, he brought back this custom of tea drinking with his friends. Now, tea was, for the Chinese, was not just a drink. It was something which was associated with camaraderie, which was associated with a kind of a sediment. And Tagore actually brought back this tea drinking ceremony to Shantiniketan. Now, his 64th birthday was celebrated, as you can see, April 14th, 1924, in China. This was one trip Tagore wanted to make because he had been, uh, you know, a great uh, disciple, as it were, uh, of the Chinese philosophy of Confucius. So Tagore traveled to the tomb of Confucius. Once again, for the communists, this was a red herring because Tagore was reiterating his identity as uh, a spiritual poet. Tagore visited the Peking theater and looked at the Chinese theater forms. He was, of course, to bring back certain of these forms within his own theater and fuse it with the Japanese no theater in Shantiniketan. But his visit to Chufu to pay homage to the tomb of Confucius, as well as his meeting with Shi Shui Shan, the warlord controlling these territories, must have raised many eyebrows. You know, for the communists, once again, Tagore was not only a spiritualist, he was seen as hobnobbing with uh, what they would call the feudal hierarchy of China. Tagore also met with the deposed emperor, Fui, at the Forbidden City, and this was the first time, this is the last emperor of China, by the way. And this is the first time that a foreigner had visited uh, the emperor since 1912. Now, this was also, again, seen as a feudal gesture. Tagore's feudal uh, positionality, he was, of course, the son of a landlord, was also being uh, brandished in China, as it were. So his reception was gradually getting more and more complicated. Before he reached Beijing, Tagore must have come to realize the feelings of antagonism towards him. He, of course, did not re read the papers, but uh, the feeling of antagonism must have uh, reached him quite significantly, though he was not aware of the magnitude and intensity of those feelings. Therefore, he writes, I even heard some were opposed to my coming but it, it, because it might check the modern enthusiasm for Western progress and force. True, if you want a man who will help you in these things, he said, in modernity, you have mistaken in asking me. Those of you who have rely on material force to make a strong nation do not know history or understand civilization either, wrote Tagore. And the reliance on power, which he saw as a Western curse of nationalism, is a characteristic of barbarism. Nations that trusted to it have already been destroyed or have remained barbarous. So here was one philosophy coming into conflict with another philosophy, as it were. Tagore was therefore harping on a different sense of 
a nation. In speaking at the Navy Club, Tagore spoke and he said about his literary career, the revolutionary role that he had played in the growth of Bengali literature, the attempts he had made to modernize its style, and the experiments he had carried out to break ground in respect of themes, in forms, and meters. So in a certain way, Tagore was trying to respond to the literary debate. He was trying to show that he was not merely involved in classical literature, the Wen Yan, but he was also modernizing Bengali literature in many ways. Tagore was actually introducing the Bengali short story into literature. He was patronizing the colloquial verse in his travel writings, but these were largely you know, subsumed under the broader context of his Gitanjali and spiritual writings. So I'm going to argue that there were two Tagores. One Tagore who wrote about spirituality, who wrote about literary sensibilities, who wrote in the tradition of high literature. There was another Tagore who was trying to experiment with form, meter, language. But this Tagore was largely unknown. And the Tagore that went to the Chinese, or the, the Tagore that the Chinese had perceived, was the Tagore of Gitanjali. Right? And he spoke about his songs, because his songs were the ones which were closest to the colloquial language. The songs were the ones which were rooted in the tradition of the Bauls of Bengal or the Fakirs of Bengal. And therefore Tagore said that he was trying to render into literature the colloquial folk language of a nation. Tagore was therefore trying to reach out to the Chinese youth and therefore claimed that this too is the work of a revolutionist. Uh, <clears throat> just a moment. Tagore also tried to claim or tried to answer this question that he was a pre-modern poet. And therefore, at Shonghuan, the largest theater hall in Be Beijing, he took a strong pitch and made a strong rebuttal against his critics who considered him out of date in this modern age. In fact, many of you are not aware that Tagore in Bangladesh, where he was a landlord, had actually first initiated farming with tractors and machinery. At Shantiniketan, again, he had brought telescopes. He had bought, brought the modern printing press. He was trying to initiate education in modern science. So in that sense, Tagore was not against science and modernity as such. He was against the ways in which science had been utilized or had been exploited by the imperial nations. So he was arguing that in India, he was being seen as too modern, whereas in China, he was seen as being only traditional, right? He noted with a touch of sadness that for your people, I am obsolete and useless. And this, and for mine, newfangled and therefore obnoxious, he asks why he had been so continually suspected to be contraband, smuggled onto the wrong shore of time. Right. So interestingly, Tagore was also looking at his revolutionary change that he had brought about in Shantiniketan, the dissolving of the caste system within the university hierarchy, his student plays which were written, for example, Chondalika against the caste system, the way in which he was trying to advocate education for women, the ways in which he was trying to advocate education in science, all this was ignored and Rabindranath was extremely pained by this, uh, this uh, lack of perception. He also talked about the movement launched by Raja Ram Mohan Roy to reform the religion of Bengal, about Bunkim Chandra Chatterjee and of national movements which gave confidence to the people in asserting their own personality. Of course, Shantini Ketan had by this time, remember, emerged as India's premier national institution. You know, in 1912, for example, the British government banned uh, that, you know, people who worked with the government should not send their children to Shantini Ketan. So it was not that Rabindranath was against the spirit of the nation as such, but he was 
against this cult of nationalism. Please remember that Tagore was the one in 1905 who had almost sung the nation, uh, at least Bengal into a nation, as it were, protesting in song after song. But he was extremely saddened to see that his idea of the nation was forgotten by the Chinese who only wanted to imitate the Western notion of the nation. So Tagore was trying in speech after speech to familiarize his Chinese audience with the, with the uh, changes, with the revolutions that he had ushered in. But of course, Rabindranath believed in evolution rather than revolution and the Chinese youth were not ready to accept it at this point of time. And he therefore wrote, the revelation of the spirit in man is truly modern. I am on its side, for I am modern. If you want to reject me, you are free to do so. But I have my right as a revolutionary to carry the flight flag of freedom of spirit into the shrine of your idols, material power and accumulation. So we are looking at fundamentally a clash between two perspectives once again. And the, the myth that Tagore was using was that of Jack the Giant Slayer. And he talked about the freedom of man from the servitude of the fetish of hugeness, the non-human. Now, you will have to, of course, remember that this is the Tagore who would travel in 1930 to Russia. And he would praise the Russian Revolution quite widely for bringing in freedom to the masses. But he would once again caution that if the, the philosophy went into only a system making, and divested human individuality, it would collapse. In fact, this was an interview he gave to the Izvestia, which was published only and only after Mikhail Gorbachev came to power in the Soviet Union. So while Rabindranath, you know, admired the nationalist spirit of China, its attempt to stand on its feet, he repeatedly cautioned that if there was only system making and that individual freedom was denied, then such systems would inevitably collapse. That was fundamental to his political philosophy, as it were. And therefore, he says, I am always on the side of Jack the human who defies the big, the gross and wins victory at the end. Now, with Tagore, of course, traveling to with Tagore was Leonard Elmhurst, who wrote, that Rabindranath was opposed on four grounds by leftist students, that he was a pacifist, he was on the side of peace, he was against machinery, he was not, but he was perceived, talked about the soul in the Confucian way, and was not a communist. Lastly, the attack was also against the scholars who had invited China to go to come to China, to talk to young men in an attempt to fill them with conservative and backward thoughts. You see, therefore, Tagore was seen as an agent of the reactionary forces who would sort of drug the Chinese youth into stupor once again. Please remember that, you know, such was the threat that Tagore was seen as by the Chinese, by the Chinese youth, as it were. And Tagore felt that these people are determined to misunderstand me and decided to deliver only one more talk. Now, we see in repeatedly in talk after talk is disappointment with, you know, uh, China, as it were, he, he wrote that, you know, you are, you, you call me uneducated, uncultured, a foolish poet. But uh, he wrote that I've come to the secret of existence in some other way, not through analysis, but as the mother's chamber can be approached by a child. You see, in many of these texts, Tagore was talking about the poet's religion. And he suggested I'd kept the spirit of the child fresh within me, intuitively attempting to reach knowledge. Because of this, I stand close to you, the young hearts of a foreign country, whom my heart recognizes as its fellow voyagers in the path of dreamland. So Tagore was arguing that the poet's religion was in dreaming of utopia and freedom of the self, rather than submitting to a cult 
of nationalism and modernity, which would breed a nation, once again, which would be high on nationalism and therefore trying to isolate itself or trying to impose a power structure on the entire global scenario. Now, you see, we have to understand today's China based on Tagore's almost foreboding in 1924. Tagore saw the seeds of a militant, antagonistic, hugely nationalistic China, which was so drunken on its material success that it almost was a mirror image of the Western imperial nations, which was at that point of time trying to colonize China. So in a way, China had become the demon which had oppressed it. China would become, Tagore sort of anticipated, the very imperial force that had once sucked its blood. <clears throat> In between, this is an archival picture of Sanyasi Tagore's play being staged at Tai Yuan. And the assault continued when he tried to deliver his talks especially in Changhu, where during the course of his lecture, he met with a vociferous group which shouted, go black slave from a lost country. In fact, Tagore faced such fury that he was almost physically protected by his, by his friends. He, of course, did not understand the slogans. But when he asked a Japanese couple, they told him what the Chinese youth felt upon him. And Tagore immediately said, stop all further interaction, let me now retire. And Tagore wrote that my enemies may dominate and slay my body, but they cannot make me adopt their methods or hate them. Interestingly, you know, Tagore was repeatedly asked by the Chinese media what he thought about China as a nation and whether he was critical of the hostility that he had received of the betrayal of uh, the, the spirit of hospitality, but Tagore refused. He wrote that uh, I absolutely refuse to accede to your request of criticizing. Uh, you have critics innumerable, and I do not want to be added to their ranks. Being human myself, he said, I can make allowances for your shortcomings, uh, and I love you in spite of them. I have done what was possible. I have made friends. But Tagore was realizing, of course, that in the course of interaction between two civilizations, there would be moments of great enmity within which you had to search for friendship. And therefore, he was suggesting that he was sort of inculcating the seeds of this friendship so that at a later stage, you know, this could blossom into a more mature relationship. Uh, on his way to Shanghai, I'm sorry, this I've already suggested. Some of your patriots were afraid that carrying from India said spiritual consciousness might weaken your vigorous faith in money and materialism. And he wrote, I assure I am entirely inoffensive. I am powerless to impair the career of progress. And I can even assure I have not convinced a singular skeptic that he has a soul or that moral beauty has greater value than material power. You see, by this time, we see a Tagore who is quite embittered, who has become extremely cynical, and is looking at China's progress into a path which is suggested would only lead them to material, you know, uh, 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 almost greed for material power. These were his last words in China. I'm certain that they will forgive me when they know the result. Almost prophetic, isn't it, what Tagore said about uh, China's emergence as a nation and its trajectory. On 30th May, he sailed from Shanghai to Japan. Now, let me come back now, having looked at the details of the trip to an overview. The Chinese hosts of Tagore, of course, never projected his anti-feudal and anti-imperialist dimensions. Therefore, Tagore's reception was already clouded by the way in which he was associated with the people who invited him. The communists also never tried to understand what Tagore was trying to do in India. At a time when class struggle was intensified in China, the wrong 
projection of Tagore would naturally have a negative effect. So Tagore was, in a certain way, a victim of circumstances also. Right? He had overstressed, Tagore, of course, had overstressed the role and significance of Oriental culture and severely criticized the materialist culture of the West in his China speeches. This was something that Stephen Hay suggested, that Tagore was, you know, underestimating uh, the cult of materialism in China. And at no point was it clarified to his audience that Tagore had never negated Western modern science and technology than that he had appealed to the Indian people to acquire them. So Tagore was operating in a zone of misunderstanding, as it were, when it came to the China trip. There was always a loss in translation of the speeches that he made and how he was presented before the audience. But on the whole, if you look at it, in the short term, this trip was a failure. If you look at it in the longer scenario, in a, on a longer term, you know, this proved to be a momentous trip because it promoted Chinese translations of his work and enlarged the area of their influence in Chinese life. You have the setting up of the Sino-Indian cultural center, which sort of tried to bring in Indian philosophy to the Chinese also. And it certainly strengthened the friendship between the two countries. After all, the first bond had been made and following up, you know, was Tagore's great disciple in many ways, who took Tagore as a mentor, Jawaharlal Nehru, who traveled to China in 1939, being, you know, one of the premier politicians to, to try and cement the India-China relationship. Right, so opening the avenues of the Sino-Indian cultural intercourse. Now, we come to the absence of the tra travelogue. Tagore, however, never wrote a travelogue on China. The only book that he published was Talks in China, which was a collection of his lectures. But even then, he revised this work and sanitized it almost in 1924. It was never translated into Chinese. The Chinese did not accept Tagore's views on China at all. Interestingly, wherever Tagore went, he wrote songs, he wrote poems. The China trip remains the one trip where there was complete sterility. Tagore was, of course, marked. This trip was also marked by a pain of being rejected by students. For Rabindranath, this was especially painful because he was, after all, an institution maker, a teacher also. So to be rejected by the poets as somebody who was completely irrelevant must have been, must have rankled Tagore to a great deal. And he was also, you know, this was the great failure, as it were, of his dream of Asia, because by now he was realizing that Asia was only imitating the West in its imperial ideas of power. Tagore went back in 1929 while he was re returning for a trip from a trip, but he stayed with Xu Mo on a private visit at Shanghai. He did not engage in any more, you know, public interactions with the Chinese as it were. Was this a failed trip? To a certain extent it was. And the silence of Tagore is comparable to the silence about America and the, and the Italy trips, you know, his sankalpa to create that bridge had been realized only partially and he had not managed to broaden the self of the Chinese at all. There was this gap between the idea of China and the reality that the new China was becoming. And this was therefore almost a replication of the Japan tour where Tagore had dreamt about a dhani Japan which would be peaceful which would follow the ideas of Buddhism, but entered into a zone, into a territory, which was extremely nationalist, military, and was once again just replicating Western nationalism. And therefore, I suggest Tagore's silence. You know, the act of not writing being an act of volition. Therefore, the travelogue, if it projects the selfhood of the traveling subject. In Tagore's case, the Tirtha became incomplete if the broadening 
and exchange did not take place. In this case, Rabindranath did not feel the completion of the circle. Yet, it's very interesting, you know, because paradoxically, the Chinese trip is in many ways the most successful trip as far as modern diplomatic exchange is, con is, is, uh, is concerned, really. Because, you know, from this actually came out something concrete, right? Nehru traveling was one, but more importantly, in Singapore in 1927, Tagore mate Tan Yun Shan. Tan was a poet. He was also associated initially with the Chinese communists, but he was looking at alternatives of Sino Indian connections. And he came into contact with Rabindranath in Singapore in 1927. So, three years after the China trip had happened, and he was so greatly influenced by Tagore that he came to Shantiniketan started Chinese studies. Please remember that this was the first university also to start Chinese studies in India. This is Tan Yun Shan in Shantiniketan with his entire family. China Bhavan, the Institute of Chinese Culture, was started in Vishwabharati in 1927. I, I'm sorry, 37. So you see, if we look at the setting up of an institution, an actual cultural bridge between the two countries. China Bhavan was probably the most concrete result of this process. Now, China Bhavan was visited by no other than, none other than two major Chinese premiers. Now, this remains the only institution to have been visited by two major Chinese premiers, uh, Chiang Kai-shek, and Zhao and Lai. Of course, for Nehru, China Bhavan was one of the most important steps in the Sino-Indian relationship. And the contribution of China, China Bhavan to in the Sino-Indian connection was recognized even by Mahatma Gandhi. So in a certain way, while Tagore's personal trip to China failed, a travelogue never came out. There was an institutional and national, almost international outcome of the China trip. So in that sense, the trip is genus faced. For Tagore, it was a trip of great pain and great personal disappointment. For the international relationship between China and India, this marked a turning point. Now, I would conclude with a few more points here. One is that Tagore realized that as two great civilizations and two tremendously populated countries which had once shared a bond, India and China operating together could create enormous opportunities. He also, however, realized that if the countries followed militant nationalism and merely material progress, then they would quickly degenerate into conflict. In a certain way, China in 2020 is already embroiled in strategic conflicts with major nations, fulfilling Rabindranath's prophecy. And an extremely militant and nationalist India could also fall within the same we need to see, or we need to look at, and this is a time to revisit Tagore's trip to China, his failure in this China trip to learn the lessons of history. That is all that I had to say. Once again, thank you for listening patiently, and thank you to NSS College Pandalam for providing with me with this opportunity to share my view.